Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining today, and welcome to our Azure Data Science Has on Lab. Um, today, we are going to be beginning this event. It will be recorded, and we'll also email the PowerPoint after. Um, you should expect that within 24 hours. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, you'll see that down in the bottom right if you do have any questions throughout. Um, and definitely don't forget to participate in our polls. Tony, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so introductions. My name is Kaylee Slattery. Um, I'm a part of our field marketing team here at Databricks, so here to help in any way needed. Uh, we have Tony Clark here. He's our strategic account executive here with Databricks. Um, we have Nada Tayab. She's a senior data scientist at Providence Health. Um, Haley Horn, who's a solution architect here at Databricks, and we also have Juan Martinez, um, who's a senior data scientist, also a Spark and NLP developer, um, and he's with John Snow Labs. On the agenda today, uh, we have some pretty exciting items. Um, we'll go through the Databricks keynote, we'll do an introduction to John Snow Labs and our current partnership. Um, Providence Health uh, will also be doing a customer presentation, um, and then we'll really get into that data science hands-on lab, where we'll learn how to train a model with Azure Databricks. Uh, from there, we have a partner demo. Uh, Johnson Labs will be going over their solution accelerators for Databricks, um, and then we'll also save some time for Q&A here at the end. All right, I'll pass it off to Tony. Awesome, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I'm assuming so. Um, yeah, so Tony Clark with Databricks, good to be here today. Um, I've personally been with Databricks about six years. I was there, um, one of their first hires outside of the headquarter in San Francisco, uh, based up here in Seattle. And uh, yeah, I've worked with a number of our largest, most strategic um, enterprises in deploying and rolling out and managing Databricks. And, and you know, really happy to be here today and talk a little bit about our vision as it relates to data science and the Lake House. So, you know, quick background about Databricks, just briefly for those of you that might not know. So, Databricks is the um, only company recognized by Gartner for both database management systems as well as data science and machine learning platforms. So, we have a number of products that kind of fit between those two arenas. Um, you know, really, we're known for founding the original um, Apache open open source Spark project. Um, since then, we've released a number of widely successful open source projects such as Delta Lake, uh, MLflow, you know, raised over a few billion dollars and have a bunch of customers, thousands of, of customers across the world. Um, you know, high level, some of the customers we work with, like don't need to spend a ton of time here, right? You know, organizations from Starbucks and the NBA, Shell, Comcast, et cetera, right? Across a number of industries. And one of the, uh, you know, things that we, we hear from customers all the time, right? Every company is wanting to do more to leverage data and specifically AI. And so just a few examples of some of the machine learning and AI use cases, for example, Credit Suisse using artificial intelligence to develop new products and services. Um, Starbucks, a great example, you know, near and dear to me that I work with that, you know, uses artificial intelligence to deliver real-time store level forecasts, you know, predict consumer demand, deliver real-time recommendations out to customers. And they do this all in Databricks. Walmart and Sam's Club, another one that's used artificial intelligence to reduce food spoilage and costs by optimizing their supply chain. So, you know, just a few examples of um, what customers are doing, but for the most part, big enterprises still struggle with data analytics and specifically machine learning and AI. So I wanna talk a bit about, um, you know, why it is that some of these companies struggle, like what's the big challenge in the industry right now and what is Databricks doing to address this? So, you know, if we take a, a step back and look at like, what are the typical architecture patterns for businesses today? We have really two disparate stacks. Uh, if we look on sort of the left of this chart to the lower left, right? We have more of the traditional analytics use cases. Think of business intelligence, data exploration, right? SQL queries. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at sort of what happened in the past. Generally, these are supported by a data warehouse, which is supporting kind of the business intelligence use cases, right? On the right, when we want to look at what will happen, predictive analytics, machine learning, AI, 
uh, automated decision making. These require a data lake, really, you know, a fully separate stack of technologies. And this, you know, has led to, you know, still today leads to a lot of like real challenges and blockers for moving to more of a machine learning and data science driven architecture. And so what are the problems? First one is we're actually having to like duplicate data across two really large, generally large and complex systems. And this is problematic, right? We have disjointed and duplicate data silos. Generally, the security model and governance model across both these systems is incompatible. Uh, we have, you know, files and blobs that are typically associated with the data lake and then more traditional data warehouse table tableacles with the data warehouse. And the end result is we have incomplete support for both of these use cases, right? We have folks doing BI and SQL in the data warehouse, data science, machine learning, and data streaming in the data lake. Uh, but, you know, when it's said and done, there's a lot of overlap with this data too, right? Folks that are, you know, data scientists doing machine learning often need data from the data warehouse. You know, more and more people doing business intelligence need uh, data from the data lake, right? And, you know, how do we kind of cross these two uh, large and complex architectures? <clears throat> so today it's too complex, right? These are the, really kind of the three key reasons why it's difficult to achieve the full potential of uh, data and AI within your organization. <clears throat> so how does uh, the lake house support this, right? So at the foundation, it's an open and reliable platform that handles both, you know, your structured data that you would associate with the data warehouse, as well as the unstructured data for the data lake. It's one unified governance and security model that covers both of these systems and use cases. Uh, and then we end up with one unified analytics platform that can cover not only your machine learning and AI, but the traditional, B, B, you know, business intelligence, SQL and streaming use cases. So how do we do this specifically, right? Um, if we look on the left at the you know foundation of, of the lake house, which is kind of what we call this paradigm, right? Of the data warehouse meets the data lake. We have all of our data stored on the cloud data lake, you know, Azure data lake, S3, et cetera, right? Uh, we look a layer above this, we have this concept of Delta Lake. And what this does is brings a transactional layer that brings reliability and performance to files on the data lake. Um, you know, another way to think of this is it makes your data lake files look and feel exactly like a data warehouse. So your users that are used to transactions, reliability um, in a data warehouse, get that within the data lake. Uh, we have Unity Catalog, which, which is an open system for delivering fine-grained governance and access control across both files in the data lake, as well as these more transactional tables that support the BI use cases, right? So Unity Catalog bridges security and governance across these. And with that, we, we tend to support four different personas, right? Folks that are working in a data warehouse, data engineers building data pipelines, engineers that are building streaming applications, and then our, of course our data scientists and you know machine learning and, and analysts, right? Uh, and there's really three key tenants when we, you know, as we look to engineer and develop uh, the Lakehouse platform, it's simple, uh, it's open, and it's multi-cloud. So with this Lakehouse, uh, as you'd expect, there's, you know, an entire ecosystem that needs to be developed around this, right? Um, and, you know, especially as we look into more of the data lake side, organizations are, you know, expecting to connect a lot of out-of-box tools, Tableau, Power BI, MicroStrategy, et cetera, right? So, you know, don't need to like sit here and, and, you know, talk about each one of these partners, but the gist of this is, you know, your end users are gonna wanna connect things like BI tools, you know, machine learning tools, such as John Snow Labs, Label Box, et cetera, you know, as well as the data science frameworks and, and notebooks they're used to. You know, these are plug and play with the lake house. Uh, you know, folks that are working in the platform side generally are, you know, looking at tools that do data governance, like Calibra and Amuda, different data pipelining tools like DBT Labs, data ingestion tools to land data. You know, these are completely plug and play as well. And then, of course, we have a full system of uh, consulting and, you know, SI partners to, to work with you as well. And then if we, we sort of, you know, double click one more layer into Azure specifically, right? So Azure made, you know, a decision a number of years ago to basically white label Databricks. So they have a product within Azure that they call Azure Databricks, right? That Microsoft packages, supports and sells as their own. And, you know, Azure Databricks is really, it's, it's Databricks in the Azure cloud. And really the advantage of, you know, Azure Databricks in this first party relationship is, you know, it's really truly a seamless, deeply integrated part of the Azure ecosystem. So all of this stuff we talked about, you know, Delta Lake, 
Unity catalog runs across all of the native Azure services. So, you know, Databricks, of course, things like um, Azure Data Factory, MLflow, Synapse, Power BI, right? They're all unified within this uh, Databricks Lakehouse ecosystem and, and really operate as, you know, one unified cohesive product. So, you know, really great relationship we have with Azure and, you know, super excited to show you uh, some demos of what this looks like here today. Uh, and so that's, you know, really like the gist of it, right? Um, you know, we're super excited at Databricks to be partnered with John Snow Labs here and talk about some of these offerings. Uh, you know, we have a number of um, areas we can invest along with our partners to like accelerate your solutions with kind of out of the box accelerators. You know, we conduct our own in-person virtual training. You know, we can bring our people to work with partners such as John Snow and partners we work with, right, to, you know, lead engagements around proof of concepts and, you know, building out production applications on Databricks. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, the gist of what I have to say. And with that, I'm super excited to hand it over to our next presenters here at John Snow Labs. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tony. Can you hear me well? Uh, yep, I can. Okay. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Martinez, and I work as a senior NLP data scientist at John Snow Labs. We are an award-winning AI company founded in 2015, focused on producing a state-of-the-art natural language processing at scale. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, our products include an open source code, Spark NLP, and several commercial libraries as Spark NLP for healthcare and Spark OCR, among others. John Snow Labs has been partnering with Databricks since 2020, collaborating in different healthcare solution accelerators and allowing many teams to carry out healthcare NLP at scale with a seamless integration with Databricks and the Lakehouse platform. In John Snow Labs, we talk and understand healthcare. We have been yearly awarded as the best artificial intelligence and analytics provider for our accuracy and performance and continue to produce a state-of-the-art models which can solve the most challenging tasks in healthcare. Yeah, this slide, um, besides counting on about 8,000 open source models and more than 700 state-of-the-art healthcare models, we also accumulate big experience in healthcare and pharma sectors, where we have been working with customers as uh, Providence Health, Roche, uh, General Electric, Novaris, Kaiser Permanente, et cetera. We would like to highlight the use case with Providence Health, which is going to be described later on this webinar, consisting of the de-identification of 700 million patient notes with protected health information, including uh, and, and using our out of the box and ready to use the identification models. With ROS, we used Spark NLP for Healthcare to extract relevant entities and the relations, creating a knowledge graph so that the biomedical innovation team could carry out question answering on that data. With General Electric Healthcare, we solve tasks as for example, structuring and structured real world radiology reports extracting the main pieces of information from them to ask, to answer questions as what, when, why. And besides that, we have been helping carry out document classification, question answering, adverse drug detection. Our models can also predict or support the clinical decision making on documents from different pathological areas, as psychiatry, oncology, radiology, or help the pharma industry with clinical trials and real world evidence and structured data. Next slide, please. And this is how our Spark NLP for Healthcare library looks like. So on the top, the very first row shows the four pillars of our library. The first pillar is clinical entity recognition, which is the main piece of information extraction and consists of detecting those relevant chunks or pieces of information for our specific use case. For example, a drug, a symptom, a patient, a condition, etc. Then on the right, we have entity linking to match those entities that we extracted to common clinical taxonomies or codification systems as SNOMED, ERAXNORM, ICD-10, TICPIX, etc. The third one is assertion status, uh, which enables us to use the textual context uh, surrounding an extracted entity, for example, if that piece of, of information is a symptom, and to check if that has been uh, or the, is referring to have happened in, uh, in the past, for example, the patient experienced this symptom in the past, or is happening right now in the present, the patient is experiencing this symptom right now, or if the patient is negating that specific condition or symptom, the patient rejects uh, experiencing something. 
As a soon as taruses are also very useful to detect if the entities are not related to the patient themselves, but attributed to other family mem members, for example. The fourth pillar is relation extraction, which allows us to understand if the entities that we extracted have something to do with each other. For example, it's able to detect relations as causality between a drug or a symptom. For example, this drug has caused this symptom or this drug improved this symptom. Other relations as temporality, the patient was taking this drug before or during or after a treatment, et cetera. Right in the middle of the chart, you can see other NLP tasks that you can carry out with SPAC NLP for healthcare, as disambiguation, obfuscating uh, protective health information, automatic document classification, text correction, pattern matching, et cetera. We offer more than 700 pretend healthcare models, which can be used right away as the, the identification models we will be discussing today. And the capability of training and fine tuning or adapting your mod the models to your very own data. The bottom part illustrates how Spark NLP is uh, supported by many different deep learning architectures, including transformers and medical transformers being built for providing high scalability, which is why it's the only NLP library running transparently on cluster and scaling as your data scale. Next slide, please. And those are only some of the capabilities you will find in Spark NLP. All of them can be consumed directly inside the Databricks Lakehouse platform, underpinned by Apache Spark and Delta Lake, an open source storage ledger that brings governance, reliability, and performance to your data and your models. Healthcare organizations can land all of their data, including provided notes or even PDF lab reports into the bronze ingestion layer of Delta Lake, preserving the source of truth before applying any NLP transformations. Those posterior transformations can be stored in the silver layer, leaving a final gold layer to finally present the extracted data ready to be visualized and exploited. Just Node Labs NLP library are native to Spark and Spark machine learning library, Spark ML Lib, and are highly performant on Databricks. They are partic particularly well suited for building unified NLP, NLP and ML uh, pipelines in Databricks. Just configure your own pipeline to process unstructured documents from different sources and different input formats and get structured information as a result. Save your models and pipelines and track them in MLflow, serve them behind an API, for example, using the uh, Databricks Jobs API, configure different cluster scenario depending on your testing, staging, or production deployments, et cetera. Finally, export your data to your fav uh, favorite business intelligence tools, SQL analytics, or even real-time applications, and you are ready to leverage the power of NLP at scale. That's it on, on my end. Now I will hand it over to Nada from Tigria, who will explain the de-identification use case they carried out with Providence Health. All yours, thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan. Okay, so can, can everyone hear me? Good to go? Yeah. All right, my name is Nada Taib. I'm a senior data scientist at Tegria. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how Providence is de-identifying patient notes at massive scale using Azure, John Snow Labs, and Databricks. Next slide, please. Tegria is a healthcare consulting and services company wholly owned by Providence that was formed to help Providence achieve its mission for health for a better world. And next slide. And Providence is a very, very large health system, 52 hospitals, over a thousand clinics. And from a data perspective, we're talking about 20 million plus unique patients over a 10 year period uh, in, their, in, um, uh, in terms of electronic data that's available. So we're truly talking about a big data problem when, when we're talking about working with Providence. Next slide, please. The, the vision for de-identification goes well beyond patient notes. The, 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 the broader goal is to ingest uh, many different types of data um, into Providence's secure cloud infrastructure and to create a de-identified data consumption zone that can be accessed by analysts, by developers, by researchers. And Providence is very advanced 
uh, among health systems in terms of its secure cloud infrastructure and how much of this data is already in the cloud. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? What's the value proposition? Well, first and foremost, medical research to make more and richer data available for medical research and really open up the floodgates for some tremendous innovation that can take place by, by breaking down some of the, the barriers and difficulty in getting de-identified data. Secondly, the pandemic really showed Providence and, and other health systems how important it is to be able to share data to respond to emerging threats. And finally, this, this I actually never even thought about until I, I started working this project. It's actually part of Providence's layered approach to security. Because right now, think about it, um, instead of ha right now, data scientists, analysts, and so on are accessing PHI directly, now they don't have to, they can access de-identified data. And so fewer people need to access PHI. So this would really be a very powerful additional security layer in within Providence's secure cloud. Next slide, please. Now that we've talked about the big vision and why we're doing this, let's get down to some practical details. So how does de-identification of patient notes actually work? And why do we even care so much about the patient notes? Well, for those of you that aren't in healthcare, the patient notes is really where the gold is. I mean, that's where most of the information actually lives. It's this messy, unstructured format. And uh, patient notes are littered with identifiers, names, email addresses, street addresses, dates, account numbers, you name it, it's in there. Therefore, step one, next slide, is to tag all the identifiers. Uh, now, you could stop there, but you know, what if, and, and no human or model can ever be 100% perfect, but what if you miss an identifier? If you just leave it here, you know, it's it's really obvious what um, if 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 an identifier is missed. So you want to take it to the second step, which is to obfuscate the data, where you replace the real data with fake data, and so now it's very difficult to know um, if if an identifier is missed, whether it's real or it's fake. Next slide, please. So how do we do seven hundred million of these? Well, the answer can only be deep learning. We are using Spark NLP for healthcare from John Snow Labs. And um, that, that tagging step that I showed you is done through via a subtask of NLP called Named Entity Recognition. And we are using pre-trained NER models to tag the, the patient identifiers. And, um, and the models are essentially taking in the text, converting them, converting the, the tokens or the words into vector representations and taking some other character level features, putting it all together uh, to, to, to build a model that can do this. So for the data scientists that are listening, I mean, you know, this, this looks pretty complicated. You could, in theory, you, you can build this yourself, but it could take a minute or a year. Or you could use a pre-trained model from John Snow Labs, which is, which is what we're doing um, to do this task. And I'll show you later um, some results. So you can see how well it's actually working on our data. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I really love about using this technology is that the code is really simple, scalable, and easy to use. So Juan will actually take you through this code and show you how it works. I just put it up there to show you how modular it is. And essentially a uh, raw text comes in, right? And it goes through a bunch of steps, including the obfuscation step and out pops your de-identified patient note. So, so that part is, is pretty awesome. Next slide, please. The second thing I love about it is that um, uh, Johnson Labs is built on Apache Spark. So it's scalable. You could run it on Databricks right out of the box. And with help from our partners at Databricks, we have now gotten, we've managed to do 100,000 notes in 26 and a half minutes. And we're still working on tuning the clusters to get that number down further. So um, I think the, the lesson is that the, the incredible thing um, to me is that using this these incredibly complex deep learning models and, and this incredible you know, computing power is, is the relatively easy part. I mean, once you get the hang of it, I'll tell you what the hard part is. Next slide. Meeting HIPAA, because uh, HIPAA, HIPAA is the, those are the privacy rules that govern how protected health information can be used and how it's protected, you know, among other things. And there are two ways to de-identify um, 
PHI. So one is safe harbor, where you just remove 18 types of identifiers, but that can only be done with structured data. Uh, for unstructured data, you have to use something called expert determination, where you apply statistical or scientific principles to determine that there is a very small risk that the anticipated recipient could identify the individual, right? So it's all about evaluating re-identification risk. And of course, the law doesn't actually tell you how to do it. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit now, the next slide, about how we are evaluating re-identification risk, right? Because I promised you some to show you some results. So there are three steps, sampling, annotation, and then, of course, evaluation. Next slide. Uh, sampling, just real quick, we drew a stratified random sample of 683 notes, stratified by gender, race, and location. Next slide. We annotated these notes, and annotation means that you actually go through and correct all the mistakes made by the model on those 683 notes, so you can yield a labeled data set that you can now use to evaluate the, the accuracy of the model, or you know, whatever metrics you want to run. So here are the results, right? So these are um, two models plus just a little bit of very simple regex. Um, and uh, the, our, the pipeline was able to tag 98% of the identifiers in the 683 nodes, right? So that, that sounds pretty good. But because of what we really care about is re-identification risk, we also have to look at how well did the model do at an actual note level? So before de-identification, 75% of the notes had one or more identifiers. And after the identification, 13% of them still had something lying around. So isn't it interesting that that 2% that was missed is spread out across 13% of the nodes? So we had to dig a little bit deeper to figure out what was going on. Next slide. So what was going on is that the model, you know, as you can see before de-identification, you know, majority of identifiers are dates, a few patient names, some IDs, addresses, and so on. Afterwards, the 106 that were missed, two thirds of those were patient names. So definitely something going on with patient names. And our, in our second iteration of this, we're working, we, we're using some techniques to bring that number down, which is also to emphasize that this really is an iterative process. Next slide. Um, also, if we look at a note level, um, I think something that is was very, very encouraging is that some of the really, uh, um, the, the, the highest risk identifiers, like phone number, street address, email address, I mean, if you have that, right, it's game over, right? You, you probably find that individual. That came down to zero or close to zero percent in terms of prevalence in the notes post-de-identification. So again, it's really important to look deeper at the results, not just at the high level. So in sum, that's just, that's just a really quick overview of the type of work that we're doing. Um, we're also doing some work in equity analysis, you know, looking at does, do these models work as well on, um, on Asians and on other minorities and so on. Um, and, and this has just seemed like an appropriate final slide to show you how it all works. You know, if the data is, you know, has been brought into Snowflake and then it comes into Azure Cloud and the secure infrastructure. Uh, we use Databricks to do um, uh, weekly and I actually believe it's daily now, full refreshes of you know, a certain subset of the most important um, tables out of the MR. Um, we're using, um, it's all sell, saved on the Delta Lake and um, also using Databricks to run the de-identification. Um, we're still working on the unstructured text, but a lot of the structured text is currently running today. Um, and uh, so I hope this gave you a little bit of flavor and thank you very much for inviting me. If you enjoyed the presentation. Hand thank it over to the next Nadia person. Haley. Yes, thank you, Nadia. Um, Thank you, unshare, and then I'll take over the screen. Awesome. Um, one second. Here we go. All right. Can everybody see my screen and hear me okay? Okay, we're going to start out with some housekeeping. And um, first, if you haven't already, um, use this uh, lab registration link. I believe Kaylee put it in the chat. And that's going to get you to our Cloud Labs workspace that you need. 
And then second, um, this lab guide, this hands-on lab guide. So when you get to the notebooks, there's going to be, um, this is when you get the registration link, you fill out this information. Um, these are the credentials that you're gonna use. And one thing that we mentioned is use incognito mode, especially if you are already using um, Databricks or, or Azure AD, um, your, you, it could default to your existing uh, login. So you're gonna want to use the login that's provisioned to you at the lab and use the username password, just um, you know, open it in an incognito window. And then very important, there's um, some additional environment details that you're going to uh, need for the workbook. So um, keep those handy because you're gonna want to copy and paste those in a second. So we'll give, I see Q and A's. I know we have our friends uh, running the Q and A, the lab link spins, okay. I'm going to let them handle that. Um, also, just on the note of Q&A, you might, um, going through the process, might come up with some questions that are a little more specific to your environment. So if it's something that's kind of off topic, you might um, you know, leave your email and just ask for follow-up after the call um, so that our Q&A folks can, can get to everybody's questions. Um, next, I'm going to open up my lab environment. So um, as everybody, the hands-on lab link is in the, the chat right now. So as everybody's getting logged in, I'm just gonna do kind of an uh, overview of the workspace of the uh, database, Databricks workspace. So um, I am in the machine learning um, persona. If your homepage looks a little different than this, you can right under the Databricks logo, click and go ahead and select machine learning. Um, the different personas have slightly different views. Um, data engineering doesn't necessarily have to look at models. So although this is all sitting on top of the same data, uh, for our purposes today, you're going to want to click on machine learning. And this, uh, let's everybody get to the landing page. And then there's going to be a few different uh, spots we're going to focus on today. Uh, first thing I'd like everyone to do is click on compute. So you develop uh, in Databricks using notebooks. Compute is going to give you clusters uh, to power your notebook. So we have built a cluster for you. All you have to do is uh, click start on your cluster. You do not have to create a cluster, but let me go ahead and show you how to create a cluster just in case you ever need to. So all you have to do is give it a cluster name. There's a couple different cluster modes. They, you see high concurrency here, um, that's that's being deprecated. That's typically people are using Databricks SQL if you have a bunch of people um, running queries. Today, we're gonna use standard. A lot of times for data science, you might choose to use single node uh, for development. And that just means you're gonna use a driver. You're not gonna use uh, worker machines. And then Databricks runtime. So what Databricks runtime is, is there's a standard set of libraries we all use uh, for developing uh, notebooks and data science, so pandas, numpy. Databricks Runtime has a lot of these common libraries preloaded. So standard is gonna be for more like data engineering or, or normal programming workloads. If you click on machine learning runtime, machine learning runtimes have you know, your favorite data science packages. So it's got sklearn and TensorFlow. So whenever you're doing uh, data science, uh, data science and machine learning, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and select a machine learning runtime. Um, this photon acceleration, you might've seen a pop-up about it. Um, I tend to use that for my ETL workloads. Um, most of Databricks is written in Spark. Uh, photon is a new engine that we rewrote using C++, because if you think about it, Spark is 15 years old, it's about to drive. Um, and we found that there could be faster ways that don't have the um, the JVM uh, and garbage collection uh, issues that sometimes Spark can have with big ETL workloads. So Photon makes things faster. Um, other things that I can call out is auto scaling. So this is how we have this elastic compute and how your, your compute can scale with your workloads. So if you have a workload and you start running it and it needs two workers, but bunch of data comes in and you need you know more processing power you can auto scale it and set as many workers as you need or don't need so that you can adjust to your workload and then um, terminate after a certain number of minutes of activity and this is so you don't leave your cluster running um, when you don't need it 
Okay. And then I'm going to use a standard worker type. This is, should be set up like this for your environment. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this. I'm not going to create a new cluster, but hopefully everybody has started their cluster um, as we get to it. And I'm going to stop video so I can just focus on the lab. So we're going to, next, we're going to look at workspace. Now, workspace, <clears throat> excuse me, is where you have your notebooks stored. You could also, um, we connect with GitHub. So one moment. We connect with GitHub. So if you have your data in repos, you can also um, clone repos and, and do your CI CD this way. But for this uh, workspace or for this lab, we've loaded this folder and mine is called ADB Quick Start Labs 1. Um, yours might or might not have the one. It just depends on when it was loaded. So just take a look at your workspace. You're going to want to navigate to O3 Data Science. That's going to be the notebook we're going to use today. And go ahead and open that up. All right. So once you're here, you can notice at the very top, these are called widgets. And this is these are kind of environmental variables that you're going to need to um, get started. So if you can recall this page right here, um, you're going to copy the data from here. There is a the one thing that's confusing to some folks is this account key. And that is actually called the blob storage account key. So it's kind of at the bottom. So you're going to want to copy that, pop it in here, and then copy and paste your blob account name, your blob container name. And then if your token is not pre-populated, I can show you in a second um, how to do uh, the token. Okay. And let me go ahead and do that now. So to get this Databricks token, you're just going to go to um, your user settings. And it'll just take a second. So go to user settings and click on generate a new token. Just give it a name. My token's for the demo. Click generate. And you will want to copy this. You can put it on a clipboard or something, but put this in your notebook. Um, and we'll use that later on in the demo. All the options, the presenter showing a state. Okay. It might be pre-populated on yours. It was on mine. So um, as my account has access, okay, you might not see that. So hopefully you've got all of these options. These were, these were shared when you set up the lab. So let's get into it on the lab itself. Um, so my background before going to, to Databricks is I was a data scientist. I worked in marketing. So I am excited to talk about data science with everybody because uh, it's kind of my, something I enjoy doing. So. Um, this is a quick start for, for data scientists. Again, at the top, these are widgets um, that help populate the, the um, get you to the right places in the blob storage. Okay, I'm going to move the Q&A because it keeps popping up. Um, if you can see these run, these refer to some other setup. If you, if you explore these notebooks, these are some, um, you have, you'll have access to all of this after the lab so you can investigate and see what is in each but one of the things when we talk about Databricks is it's a unified platform. And on, it is one spot, you have your data in one space, in this case, it's an ADLS, but a power of Databricks is everybody can work together. You don't have to move into different environments or export data and import it into different places. You're all working in the same spot. So your data engineer um, can be logged in doing their work, and then you can use the product of what they build um, for your data science workflows. So this is just kind of a shortcut. We're gonna ingest the data sets and let's talk about data science and machine learning. So basically data science machine learning, it's an integrated end-to-end -end ML environment. We have managers, managed services for experiment tracking, uh, model training, feature uh, development and management and um, feature serving and model serving. And being on the same platform as everybody, uh, we can use the best practices of data architecture. And that is, you know, ingesting the data raw and then aggregating it and cleaning it into a silver layer. And then gold tends to go into reporting 
Um, so you have your data in one place and then you can do your data science off of, uh, in this case, we're gonna do it off of the silver layer. And it also has a way to serve it. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for all of your data science needs. And it's a data native solution. Um, so again, one single platform. We talked about the data, all of the data engineering work. You can go into your workspace and you can see how the data you know, was transformed from a CSV file into the tables. Uh, but for this, we're just gonna load the table. So we have bronze. This is a bunch of member data. So this use case is um, a Korean music subscription service. And we're going to look into information about our customers um, and, the, and do churn prediction. So like, what are some characteristics that cause um, that can predict whether a customer is going to churn or not. And so one of the one of the newer things, and I say newer, probably in the last five years with data science has been the use of the feature store. And so for the feature store, um, when you have a bunch of data scientists working, part of data science is coming up with features or, you know, uh, variables, whatever you want to call it. But if you're doing data at scale, let's say you have 60, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of customers, you might be doing some minor data feature engineering, but at scale, it can take some time. And especially if you have multiple data scientists working, that can mean you have several people doing the same transformations over and over again. And it's, you know, that takes time, that takes processing power. So using a, a concept of a feature store is you have a centralized repository of features and that they are transformed in a consistent way. So, um, you know, if you're doing aggregations, you can have small nuances on the difference on how you do aggregations that can impact your model later. So with a feature registry, it's a way that, you know, one data scientist can create a feature from your customer data and then the other data scientists can you know, search and then use that same feature in their modeling. Um, it's built on Delta technology, which means that you have a version control. You can um, you know, go back in time and see how the, you know, the data has changed over time and you have lineage. You'll, you'll be able to see what notebook produced that feature and what is the impact. So um, we'll look at that a little in a little bit more detail. And then from the MLflow side of the house, you have batch and this uh, feature store is integrated with MLflow. It's integrated with your model um, serving. So um, it's you know sealed in with that model so you can see exactly what features you used and, and the logic that was made to uh, create them. And it also provides a way to um, use the features either in batch or online for low latency serving. All right. Just check. Okay, so let's start with uh, doing some featureization. We're gonna start by looking at some user data and we're gonna join and we're gonna do some aggregations on the user log. So for, um, you know, each user might have multiple rows. This is gonna count um, the number of transactions, the number of top 25 songs, top 100 songs a user is viewing and then um, do a mean of the total seconds. So how long are they listening? And then how many seconds have they actually heard? And so this is creating this new uh, data frame called user logs consolidated. And then we're gonna create a feature table. So um, we're gonna join the user logs consolidated information, the data frame we just created. We're gonna join on MSNO, which is membership you know, subscriber number with a members table. And then we start doing some data quality. If we have ages that are less than 15 or greater than 100, we're gonna exclude those. We're only gonna keep these uh, ones with the, that meet that criteria. And we're gonna fill in a for um, gender that's not present. So we might have some nulls. Instead of nulls, we're gonna put in, fill in in a. Oh, um, Yes, so I think I'm seeing some people are having an issue with um, uh, commands five and six, and I'm sorry, I jumped ahead on that one. Uh, let me, let's talk about that real quick. So for mine, since my library, since my link was loaded with, um, instead of quick start labs, it was called quick start labs one. 
I had to just change this link to pop a one in there and then I was able to run it and it works just fine. So if you have that issue, if you can just double check to see, make sure that that matches um, what your folder name is that you should um, get unstuck there. And then same thing with command six, like I had to, to add a one in there as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go down. I ran those um, quickly and then get back. We just ran the ag aggregate um, data. We created this member table, um, categorical variables. So we have gender, we have, you know, I think three different values. We'd have male, female, and NA at this point. So we're gonna use a string indexer to um, get that data prepped for modeling. Um, one of the things with models is that the data rarely is in the right format that you need just to feed into a model. So you'll do things like, um, you know, handle your categorical variables with string indexing or some other methods. Um, you know, it might, you've got control of the, the notebook. So whatever um, your prep method is, this is the one that we're using for gender. Um, and then we're going to write it out to a feature, a members feature table. So in this, uh, we're working as it with a data frame, but we're going to save it here as a table. Um, and this way we can query. Um, once it's saved as a table, we can use SQL to query and investigate the, the data more. So to actually get this working with MLflow as a feature table, we're going to import uh, databricks.featurestore and we're gonna instantiate the client and we're registering the table as a feature store table. This is where the magic happens. And so we're gonna name the table Mender Features. We're gonna indicate the primary key so that the feature store, um, the, the rows are tied to an individual member. And one good practice um, that we should all be doing is, is using things like descriptions and metadata. Whenever we have the chance, um, to, you know, give somebody additional context of what, what a table is doing, that's, that's a best practice. And so again, the feature store is a way to, uh, it kind of decouples and, and has the features that are used to generate one or more models um, in a repository. So multiple data scientists can use these features and um, for, for building models. All right, so we created this feature store table. And if you look on the left column here, um, we have compute what we looked at earlier. Um, experiments, we're gonna click on feature store and let's go ahead and click on that. And I'll, I'll do it in just one second. The feature store, this gives you a list of all the feature tables that you have in your environment. In my environment, I just have one. Um, so we can see who created it. I'm the instructor. I created it. This is not currently scheduled. So what scheduling means is once you finish your development, you can, and you have a job that you want to run on a, a different, um, you know, scheduled basis, you can do this concept of a workflow, which is a way to schedule jobs on, um, uh, any time, you know, cron that you want it to be. You can also run, get things. But you can basically, if I want a model or a featured uh, workflow to run once a day, I can just name it, um, point it to the notebook and, and schedule it. So in this case, I don't have it scheduled, but I could very easily. We're gonna click on into this feature table and let's take a look at the top of it. Um, at the top, it has kind of metadata about the table. So the day it was, it was imported, um, who who imported it, what's the modification date, um, the data sources, like what data sources um, contributed to it. I can see what produced it, what produced this feature store is a notebook called the data scientist and you can click into that. We can see the features um, that are used in the data store. So we can see that, um, you know, birth date, city, gender, all of these are used in this notebook. And once they're using a model, you can see them related to a model and endpoints. And if they're scheduled for jobs, we can see that as well. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the notebook. 
Um, one thing that is pretty handy, especially if you're doing a lot of notebooks at a time, you can go into recents and this is the recent notebook I've been working on. It can get me um, back to where I started. Um, particularly handy if you're juggling multiple notebooks. One thing I'd also think is worth pointing out is if you have multiple people working on a notebook, I'm just gonna uh, duplicate this tab for a second. Um, collaboration, data science is definitely a team sport. So you can have, a, just like um, if you're using you know, Word online or, or anything online, you can have multiple people collaborate in a document. So I can see since I cloned this tab, I'm it's me working on the, the same document with myself, but you can have multiple people working in on a note on a notebook and you can make notes or comments. You can, you know, ask questions like this, this code looks weird. Can you double check this? Um, and that that keeps you from having to, you know, export things to Git or having multiple copies of a notebook, which can, you know, cause all sorts of rework. All right, so we we took a look at um, the feature table. We we looked at the producers, what created it, um, where the notebook came from. Next, we're going to create um, some inference data. And we'll start out by joining the transactions data set with the members data set. Um, this should look pretty familiar um, if you've been building models before. You're gonna drop some columns that you might not need. Um, and then we're going to look at this this new resulting data set. So we have our unique um, member number um, with our uh, payment method, just different information about um, how the member has purchased and, and worked with with the data. Sorry, I'm just checking the Q and A count. Okay, so now we're going to do some data cleaning and feature engineering. We're going to since we're looking at churn. Something that's uh, useful with churn is to see how many days a user has been on the platform. How long has our, the user been with us? So we're gonna create this uh, new column and add to the churn data called days on board. And it's just looking at the membership start date and, and expire date and calculating that difference and adding it as a column. Um, one thing that might be useful is, did we offer this user a discount when they signed up? And we can see if that has anything materially to do with the churn. We also have some, now that we've done this calculation on days on board, we no longer really need the registration date and the expire date. So we're gonna drop those so we don't have additional columns that we don't need um, that could you know, introduce multicollinearity um, with your model. And again, we're going to fill uh, the gender column with an A for, for this data set if we have any nulls. And we're gonna write this to a new table called churn data. And we're gonna actually create a table. Um, and this is gonna be considered a silver level table because we're doing aggregations and cleanup. And that's kind of the difference between silver and let's say a bronze or a raw table. The raw table is gonna be what the data looked like when it came in. Silver, as you you know get into the, the higher levels uh, in your data warehouses, the cleaner and the more um, kind of crystallized the, the data is. So we created it as a table, we wrote it to a table. So now we can use SQL. So I think SQL, we've been seeing um, more and more data scientists using it as a primary language um, in addition to Python, because SQL is just very easy to manipulate uh, data with. So um, we can see the data executed here. I think one thing that's interesting is we can also, um, there's some built-in visualizations that you can do to, we don't necessarily need to visualize member number, but we can look at, you know, it looks like for some reason we have gave more discounts uh, to men than women. So it makes it very quick and dirty way of doing visualizations because sometimes visualizations are just easier way to process data than, you know, strictly looking at a table. Um, so next we're gonna create a training data set and we're gonna, this is where we're gonna actually use that feature table. So. Um, regardless of whether I created the feature table or not, I can use this to start creating a data set that I want to train my data on. So for this, we're going to um, call the feature store. We're going to use a feature called feature lookup. And we're going to look up this uh, member features table. 
And these are the, the names we're going to use. And we're going to use MSNO as the, the member number key. And so to create the training set, this is the command is create, tra create training set. And we'll do, you know, hey, read this table, read the churn data table. And for the feature lookups, we're going to use this feature lookup table from our feature features table. Um, the label that we use is is churn. So that's what we're predicting. Does, does this person churn? Does this person not churn? And we're not going to include member number uh, in for the training set. So we're, we are writing this to a data frame and we're, we're excluding the ones where in, in it time is not null because we want to just include members. You might be asking, you know, if this is a training set, where's your test train split? And that's, that's going to be coming along shortly. Um, we are writing this training data to a silver table so that we have, a, we have good history and we can interrogate the data later as a table. And then our good old test, taint, test train split here. Now we're doing it sort of manually by doing a random split. If you, know, you prefer to use something like scikit-learn for doing your test train split, that's fine. Um, you can you know, you can do, use that as well. Just for this use case, we're, we're splitting it this way. Um, and so let's take a second. Um, the next section is when we're actually going to start modeling. So up to this point, we, our data engineer gave us all of this data. We did some feature engineering. We created a feature table. And now we've created a training data set and we've split it into a test train, test train split. Okay. Now, um, one of the newer features this year that we have um, in, introduced in, in Databricks is AutoML. And AutoML, it's not new. Um, however, one of the things, you know, we've, we've embraced the open source and transparency and AutoML is, is no different. We have a glass box solution. So you get to see exactly, you know, what models are being run. Um, and, you know, we create notebooks so that you can, you can even edit it. So we might get you you know, a certain amount of the way, and you might want to make customizations, and you can. It's um, out of the box. You you have a pretty good um, start for your modeling process. So there's two different ways, or that I'll show on um, creating AutoML. And for this, I'm going to do AutoML in the notebook. So that's uh, you know one way you can start an start an AutoML problem. I will also show you can create um, an auto ML experiment here off of the create tab. And if you, I'm just going to jump windows to make this. There's also a, if you're in the machine learning work time, there's, you can also start auto ML from this landing page. So a couple different ways um, to do an auto ML problem. So since we're predict predicting churn, this is a classification model. So um, we're going to say auto ML is going to be class by our training. Uh, data frames can be train df. Again, our target column is this churn. And for this um, particular problem where you're using F1 as a training metric, but we'll look at it in a second. You can you can select if accuracy is a better measure. Um, you can you can adjust this. And since this is a you know short lab, we're going to do a timeout of um, of five minutes. And I went ahead and ran this so y'all didn't have to wait for five minutes, but this is the output. It took five minutes to run and out of the box, um, we create three folders for you. So as you know, data science always starts with EDA. So we auto generate um, whenever you run an auto ML job in uh, Databricks using Databricks auto ML, it creates a data exploration notebook, which give that a second open. Um, uses pandas profiling so that you can take a look at expand my window because everything's garbled. Um, this lets you take a look at frequently occurring first rows, last rows. It gives you a look at the missing values, um, correlations, and a couple of different um, uh, metrics to look at autocorrelations. So this is out of the box. Um, you can see distribution. It even gives you warning. So this has um, high correlation. It shows you things that have high cardinality uh, from the data set. So 
um, saves you a little bit of time with EDA. The next is, you know, you've run, this helps you run a lot of trials, you know, however many models ran in five minutes, it um, shows you the best trial notebook. So out of all of these models that I ran in five minutes, this logistic regression training notebook is what was the most performant model based on my F1 metric. And then last, all of the trials in ML flow are logged as an experiment. So, um, you know, this, this way you're looking at your, the problem you're solving holistically uh, through ML flow. So it also lets you look at the, open like a new tab, look at the experiment. And in this case, you can see we ran, okay, we ran about six models in that five minute time frame. Um, if I want to look at the specific uh, notebook, you can click into a model and look at one. You can also compare. So if I want to compare two or if I want to compare all of my notebooks, um, there's a view where you can compare the outcomes and see, um, you know, based on each of the runs, the decision tree versus random forest, it might be important if one runs significantly quicker than another um, or it might, you know, you might have a preference of using a tree-based model than others. It gives you a pretty quick way to compare and look at all that information. Um, one thing I'll also point out is since we're doing all of this in ML flow, you see up here, we looked at comments earlier. We can also see the experiments tab. So we can very quickly, without even leaving our notebook, um, we can have a view of the different models that have been run as uh, part of our notebook and you don't this this will work with you don't have to use auto ml if you're doing any kind of modeling and you call ml flow this will get tracked all of your experiment runs will be tracked and then i think one other thing i want to point out while we're up here is revision history um, so you can see all of the um, all of the changes that have done i've done with the notebook you can also revert back to changes so let's say you worked pretty late last night and then in the morning you realize something that you did, uh, you wanted to revert, you can actually go to your, you know, best, you can go to prior to whenever something bad happened and go back to it. Um, and you have a history. This has come, this has been very handy recently <laughs> when I've had some changes that just, I didn't realize it had some breaking changes at the time. So in any kind of book data engineering or in my data science notebooks, you can go back. So um, the other great thing about this is it's reproducible. You have you have history, you have copies of all of your trials. So um, if you wanna go back and look at the different notebooks for each of the trials, AutoML um, generates a notebook for each and every experiment that you run for each and every model. Okay, so, um, I think we looked at uh, kicking off the auto ML using the UI. And to do that, basically you select a compute, you select a, a, a cluster to run. You do the same selection of a classification problem. You choose your data set. So this is the same data set. If I wanted to run it in the UI versus um, running auto ML in the notebook, you select your target. Um, this is an auto generated name but you can rename it to whatever you want. And then advanced configuration lets you choose if you want to use specific frameworks. So let's say you only want to use XGBoost for some reason or scikit-learn, you can, you know, you can cross out and, and not select light GBM. You can also adjust the stopping condition. So if you want, we only ran this for five minutes. So we got six models. You can set it for 60 minutes and then, you know, step away, do something else for 60 minutes and let this run. And then next, let's talk about um, continuous model integration and development. So it, there's more than one person who decides whether a model gets moved to staging and production. Um, so this is, uh, MLflow has an integrative way that you can you know, graduate a model to staging and production or compare, um, and that's using the model registry. So we, have been training this model and it's being tracked with MLflow. Um, the next step is we, we register the model with model registry. And you can do this in the UI or you can do an, use an API. And so in this case, when we looked at this 
ML flow experiment. Um, mm -mm. Close this. This is the um, the experiments page. Let's say we're going to look at this model, and we decide this is a great model. I've promoted it to the stage production now. Realizing that in, in real world practice, it's not usually just one person's decision. Um, you can build rules and web hooks. So you can say this needs to be approved by another person, have another set of eyes, approve the model or another team. Um, if you have some kind of modern model governance um, to approve models for being moved from staging to production or, or to archive it. Um, and then, yeah, so this model we'd already registered, but let's say if there's a different one, we can always choose any of the models that we, that we have, um, oops, any of the models that we've created, um, oh, sorry, it's under experiments. Da, da, da. Right. So if we decide, you know, this accuracy is pretty close to this one. And I want to like A-B test, I wanna have a couple models in staging. Um, I can also click to register this model. And I will name it. Now I'm going to register this guy. All right. So as we're looking at this this specific model, let's take a look at um, the information and the metadata we have about a model. Um, we have the parameters that got clocked when we we registered the model with MLflow. We have the different metrics that um, were automatically registered in this case with our auto ML, um, and then we have model artifacts. So if I wanted to export this model, share this model, or even have you know copies of you know how this model was uh, put together, what are the requirements? Like what libraries um, were used to generate the model? You have um, all of this information, and then you can also we create the code and we share the code on how to predict, um, make predictions in a batch way against this model using either a Spark data frame or a Pandas data frame. And we have information about the schema um, and some of the other artifacts that we have saved are things like the confusion matrix and the ROC curve. All right, we're going to jump back to the notebook. All right, so this is what we just looked at on how to register model, giving it a name. Um, and then we can also click on um, under registered model, we can see all of the logistic models that we have um, for the experiment. And we can also see the versions of the model. So this, we for this example, we have one version for the one that we just clicked on, we had a, a couple different, and you can click stage to negotiate this model through the different um, stages, which we just also looked at. And we moved, I had already moved the model to production. So we have one um, production model. Um, and you can also, you can have, if you do A-B testing, you can have uh, shadow models in production as well. Um, you know, all of this can be adjusted. It's very customizable based on whatever your process is. We, we went and registered the model through the API. You can also register the model, excuse me, through the UI. You can also register the model through the API. So in this case, we want to look at our best um, trial. And so since we did auto ML, we can just say, hey, give me information about the best trial run from this auto ML run. So this gives us, it took about a little over a minute in our evaluation metric, our F1 score 0.904. So using the syntax, we can register it as the, the actual best model run and the model URI, this we have it, um, we don't have to actually copy the run ID. We just want to have the um, URI of whatever the best trial model that we have. And then we'll call that the registered model version. So we've successfully registered the model, version one, um, K, KK box, churn prediction. 
I think we had talked about before with the feature table, adding metadata and a description as a, is really a best practice. So we have, um, we're instantiating the ML, ML flow client and we're gonna update this registered model and we're gonna add a description that this model predicts churn so that you know two months later or whenever somebody comes back, they can really understand what the model is doing. The metadata can be very helpful in those cases. All right. All right. We looked at um, we looked at how to do a model stage transition uh, using the UI. You, all of these can be done in CLI. Here's some code, and in a notebook. So this is where we can change um, the registered model version. We can change the stage and then have confirmation. And this is handy. Um, you know, eventually in the maturity stage when you get to where you're scripting. Um, this process or, uh, you know, scripting it to use webhooks, all of this can be automated. All right. Next, we're going to talk about using the production model in a downstream application. So let's say your data science team is done. Your, your data engineers have, have prepped all the data, got the data to you to do your featureization as a data scientist. You have run a bunch of models. You've selected your, your correct one for production. How do you share this with the deployment team? Um, so we're gonna show two different ways to serve up a model batch inference. And then um, you can also do model serving now on Databricks. So for batch inference testing, um, we, we share the code on the model for each of the models on how you can um, do batch inference testing. So let me close some of these to get back to the specific model. Um, so for model serving, this is on our KKBox churn prediction. Um, we got here by clicking on the model and going to our model that's in production. Um, if you want to see an example, just click show example and it gives you the example syntax. So you can change it. Um, you know, what if all of these were the same, but it's a um, female value. You can send requests and it, it'll actually give you the response. Um, it gives you the syntax if you wanna do it uh, via curl or this is the, um, the same text. If, you, if you're looking at your notebook, this is the same text. You can copy this to do batch inference. Um, I also said, I wanna use this model for online inference. So um, I clicked to use, model for inference and now it's it's ready to serve. I can also see I initialize the endpoint. I, I have history. All of this is logged and I can see what size cluster um, that I used for this endpoint. So you can always adjust it. This is not a super wide uh, model. So I'm just using a DS3 V2. Um, if you're using you know very broad big data set, you can always up, upgrade and, and have a larger instance. Uh, for whatever the problem is you're working on. So with a batch inference test, I can run a data frame through and then I can get a prediction on it. And then I can also check the accuracy. So when I'm running this, um, my batch, I'm gonna use an, a, our evaluation metrics F1. So on this test, if you remember, it, this is pretty similar to when we did our training run. It's a um, very similar F1 score. If this was very different, there might be something that I need to reinvestigate with my model. If um, when I'm when I'm doing batch testing, if it's very much different than the training, um, we would want to capture and, and research that. And so now I've I, with my batch inference, I'm going to write this to a gold table so I can also um, do additional exploration on um, the predictions and and learn from um, the predictions that I've made on the data set. Okay, and since we're writing it to table, again, we can do queries. I think um, we had gone through, okay, yeah, this is where we're using the model for influence. And to enable serving, um, this does take a little bit of time. I'm not sure that y'all have permissions in your workspace. Um, to enable the serving, but um, at the very least, you can take this notebook home 
and um, it does take a second to, to get everything up and running for the testing, but um, all of this code is generated. You don't have to hand code any of this. There's a lot of um, some time savings when it comes to um, having to reinvent the wheel. These are kind of boilerplate so that you have this for your own testing. And so as you change and you go through your process, you have different versions of the models. You can still take this and, and do some batch testing as it changes over time. And then um, I know that my uh, my tokens expired for this. this um, if I try to run this, I'll get a 403 error, but this is also the same syntax if you wanted to test and test data to the model REST API um, to you know, compare the output that you're getting. And so you can also score data um, as you get it through the REST API. And then best practice when you're done, um, especially if you're doing this in test, you know, you can go back and turn off your model serving when you're, you're not using it. So you can be using your compute efficiently. So um, that is, that's the main thing I wanted to show. Um, one thing that usually comes up if you're new to using Databricks is, you know, we're using this in a lab environment. You might want to export this and use it in your own environment. So to do that, you're going to go back to your workspace. Um, instead of just doing this notebook, you can go ahead and, and go to the higher up folder and go to export. And you can export this as a DBCI archive. And that means you can import it into any Databricks workspace. Um, there's also some times where I like to export it as HTML and um, to view it. Yeah. So let's see, we wanted to talk about exporting it. Let's see what else we, we want to cover. Uh, I think we discussed this a little bit, but one of the, the powerful things is after you've done all of this development, once you're ready to productionalize things, um, workflows are a good way to um, economically like reschedule things to run. Um, one thing that's, that's relatively new is you can um, have multiple tasks of a workflow. So let's say this is, um, Let's say we've, we've got all of these folders exactly how we want them and all of these, uh, the data engineering, we've got that notebook done. I can set it up where I have the data engineering notebook ready to run. And then right upon the heels of that, I can have my model notebook run. And so it, it respects the dependencies um, that modeling's done after, let's say data engineering. So um, for this case, I can say, you know, don't run the model till da the data engineering tasks are done. And then boom, I've got a DAG that I can schedule this and say, hey, I just want to rerun this. Like I want to have this run monthly. I can schedule it every month on the fourth and then it is scheduled to run. And if I want to know if it failed, I can just say, hey, send me a notification. Um, to my email. Um, on, I can do it start success or failure. Maybe I just care if it's on failure. And so this way I can have notifications and keep tabs on my model um, as it runs. So, all right, that is the Databricks workspace. We showed um, AutoML in a notebook. Again, you can also start an AutoML problem here and yeah, let me check Q&A to see if anything has, has popped up. Looks like our Q&A friends have been um, busy. Uh, do we need to export the data set, not just the notebooks? Um, you will need to have the data set in the other environment um, if, if you're taking it to a new environment. In this case, um, the KKBox data set is, I'm not sure if we have it linked, but it is from Kaggle. So um, you can, you can export it, uh, might be best to grab it from Kaggle. Um, I think you can also set it to save um, in another environment, it, you know, save it to export. Um, but generally, especially with Kaggle data sets, I'll just build that into, into the notebook. And the, okay, in the, 
the last command line. Yeah, I was getting 403. Um, I think that's more of an artifact of us being in a, in a training environment. And then I know one thing that will come up um, a lot with this is um, this is being recorded. So you're going to get this in the next you know day or so. You'll also have access, you know, we'll share the notebooks um, uh, after the call. So I, how am I doing on time there, Kaylee? Oh, how you how are long? just fine on time. Okay. Um, how long is the lab workspace and token good for? Um, I think it's 72 hours from start. So you'll have it for a little longer. And um, Satish, the, um, you'll have this, I think for a day or two afterwards. And then if you need to, to use it later, you can always export the notebooks. For model serving, is there a way to overwrite the default predict function? Um, raw score rather than a binary classification. Um, so we, we're giving you starter. Yeah, I'll let Ben answer that. We, we're giving you starter code, but a lot of this um, you can modify. Um, ML flow is not, you can write your own metrics for ML flow, like ML, M, excuse me, F1 is a common uh, metric, uh, but you can also, I've seen teams create their own, some kind of a blended metric um, if needed. Is it possible to share variables stored in memory across um, jobs? Um, I believe the memory is restricted to a cluster. So if you need to share variables, you're gonna be um, having them temporary. I don't think it's gonna work if you're, if you're trying to share specifically across jobs and workflows. Um, there is a way to pass variables from one job to another. So um, for example, if I'm running models based on different product groups, I can pass, um, it's a pretty newer feature with jobs, I can pass a, um, a variable you know, from, from one job to, to the next job so it can pick up. And if I'm running it on like shoes, I can start it running on shoes and pass that variable for whatever field um, to the next subsequent job. Okay. All right. Well, I hope everybody's learned uh, at least something on um, on using machine learning and in, in data science with Databricks. Um, the model serving is uh, the fact that it auto generates code for the auto ML and for the model serving. I think is a time saver, as somebody who's had to copy and paste code. It also um, creates more consistent code. Um, across your environment so that you're not risking, you know, having some small nuances in code that could have a bigger output. So um, with that, I'm going to hand this back. I believe Juan is going to uh, go a little deeper into um, the Johnson Labs DI Identification Solution Accelerator. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, uh, may I share my screen? Because I want to jump from the presentation to the demo, perfect. All right. I think this should do it. Can you see my screen now? Yes. All right. Um, so for the last time that we have today, I would like to show you one of the solution accelerators that John Snow Labs has in Databricks. So first, uh, first of all, a solution accelerator is a series of uh, notebooks which are ready to use and available in the Databricks cloud. Uh, we have several of them. Uh, today, we are going to take a look at the, the identification solution accelerator. So uh, first of all, this slide, which illustrates how this accelerator works. Uh, we may have some provider notes, PDF lab reports, medical images, or whatever our data is or our uh, format of the data is. And as uh, Nada was mentioning before, we may have some restrictions to work with the raw data. So the very first step that we are going to do uh, that solution accelerator does is 
using a project that has information obfuscation to remove all of that um, data to then being able to uh, use a Spark NLP pipeline to do a name entity recognition, extract entities, doing some mapping to um, uh, clinical taxonomies, being able to calculate billable codes, uh, et cetera, whatever our use case is, but, but always working with an already uh, de-identified raw data. We, the solution accelerator uses three layers. The bronze layer is for the raw data. Um, in here, we are also adding not only textual information, not only uh, patient notes coming from digital text, but also uh, OCR uh, scan documents or, or PDFs or even images. Uh, in our suite of, of products and libraries in, uh, at John Snow Labs, we also have a Spike OCR, which allows you to get the digital text from different non-textual formats, as for example, images or, or PDFs, as, as I was mentioning. So we are going to combine this OCR extraction of text from different image and PDFs with digital text and then with that, we are going to de-identify uh, the protected health information and to store that in a very first layer, the bronze layer, and then do the rest in the posterior layers, in the silver layer to uh, all of the transformations that we're going to do that I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of minutes. And then the final information to be shown to a SME, to a business domain expert is going to be stored in the gold layer where it's uh, all the clean data will, will lie. Um, yeah, so uh, Databricks, uh, our Databricks Solution Accelerator. If you don't know them and just do a quick search um, in, in Google, for example, Databricks Solution Accelerator, you will see this uh, page, which is called Databricks Solution Accelerator, Delivered Data and AI uh, Value, which leads you to this um, uh, web page that you see here. E by default, you will see uh, many different solution accelerators. This one I'm going to use is for uh, is called PH automated PHI removal. So if we look for PHI, we will see it. And then just by clicking on this card that we you will see in the in this widget, you will get the the, the full information about what the solution accelerator does and how it, it works. You can take a look uh, later on and read uh, carefully, but it's basically what we uh, have been uh, describing today earlier on. If we go to download notebooks, we will be taken to the that part of the Databricks cloud platform where, where these notebooks are you will find four files. The first one is just a readme. Uh, in this readme, you, we, we just described the same process as Nada and me were mentioning before, like um, how to first start with some patient notes or some documents to then de-identify and do the rest of your uh, use case using uh, the different NLP models that you may you may be interested in, in using. And, how to store all this data in the different layers. So we have already uh, described this before. So let's go to the ve this very first PDF, a uh, OCR notebook, which describes how to do OCR uh, at scale using a Spark uh, OCR. As we were saying before, it's completely integrated. Our seamless integration with Databricks allows you to, to run all of our libraries, including uh, OCR, at scale in say, inside a Databricks cluster. We, in this, in this notebook, you will find an example data set of serial patient's notes, which are images. And, and by, running, by running it and by running the different cells, uh, you will be able to extract from these images all the textual information containing them. So this very first uh, cell just gets um, uh, a link to the data set and loads all the PDFs, in this case there are three, three of them. We write those PDFs to a bronze layer where all of our uh, raw data will be. And then this is the very, very um, first or the, 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 the simplest uh, pipeline, OCR pipeline that you, can, that you can use at this point. That is 
uh, converting or taking a PDF or an image and then extracting from that uh, file the text contained in it. These are a two components pipeline. And this is what we get. So basically this is a data frame when, where you would get in the third column a text a column a getting with, with all the uh, data information or the text contained in that in those images. You can also visualize the images itself. So this text that I was showing here before sample type, medical specialty, hematology, etc. as you can see comes from this uh, image that we have loaded previously. So these images is what we use in our uh, Spark OCR to get the text from. So basically this is a very simple Spark OCR frame. Our Spark OCR library has much more components since sometimes our scan of images are not very good quality. So uh, in here we are showcasing also how to do skew correction in case that your documents are tilted, for example, or have some scan problems. We can do, we can apply uh, using a Spark OCR different op operations, morphological operations or, or, or cleaning or or fixing of your images so that you can get the best of the uh, performance of our OCR method. So in this case, we have just added one additional component that is for correcting the skewness or how the documents are tilted so that we can improve the, the extraction of text from, from images. And then, yeah, there are some other um, annotators or some other components you can add to the pipeline. As Nada was mentioning before, it's very easy to do, it's very modular. You just need to add components one after another. They feed back uh, one component feed, feeds uh, its results to the next one. So as you can see in this example, we get uh, an image, then we send it to the SQ corrector. Then we can improve also the contrast of uh, black and white so that the text uh, is more is, is easier to be processed and to be extracted by the OCR, etc. And uh, as many uh, components, uh, OCR components, as you need to improve and to get the best of your uh, of the quality of your images. At at the very uh, at the very end, we have this image to text, which gets the uh, text from the images uh, that are being processed through the pipeline and all of these components in, in between. As you can see in here, there is not a huge difference, but you can see that the, the image on the on the right has a better quality, it's less uh, blurry compared to the one on the, on the left. This is just a OCR a notebook to showcase how you can also work not on the text level, but on the image level. If you, what you have is not digital notes, present notes, but, but images. But after that, what we can do is we store the text in, in, in different files and store them in the bronze layer. And then you can work uh, using any uh, natural language processing components which work with text because we have already extracted those, uh, that textual information from the images. So in the second uh, notebook, what we are going to do is we, we start uh, from the output of OCR. The output of the OCR is text. Right, because the first uh, the first notebook is from the e for image inputs getting uh, textual outputs. So this is the notebook which, which carries out natural language processing for achieving uh, the identification, obfuscation, and masking of protected health information. It's also ready to use. You can you can just try it with your data bricks license and your Jon Snow lab uh, trial that I'm going to uh, comment later on how to how to get. And uh, basically we start on, on a Spark, NLP, a Spark uh, session with a Spark NLP. We are taking all of these texts that we have extracted using OCR, which are already in our bronze layer. And I'm going to apply some transformation uh, on the top of that text. So this, I, again, another pipeline as we had in OCR, but this pipeline doesn't work with images, it works with, with texts. And it's quite simple, it's quite modular again. And what it does is it just gets a document, gets a text. The second component is splitting the text into sentences. The third component is splitting 
the sentences into, into tokens or smaller pieces or, or, or words. And then we leverage what we call embeddings, that is language models, models which understand the text uh, and, are, and are able to, or, or enable us to do other NLP tasks as name entity recognition, that is the, the next component that you see here. These um, name entity recognition components just detect those pieces of information that are relevant for you. In this case, it's a de-identification uh, component, which means we are going to detect patient health, uh, protective health information, only focusing on that part of the document which contains those, those pieces of information. I have here a visualization. We also have a module for visualizing everything inside Databricks. So as you can see, this is a patient note. This one is the very same one that we were taking a look at in an image format before doing OCR. Now it's a text. And now uh, we have added information about the different uh, tokens or pieces of information in the document, which are which should be de-identified because they are uh, uh, protective health information, right? We are talking about dates, name, patient names, doctor names, hospitals, IDs, uh, location, ages, gender, etc. This is the output of our Spark NLP pipeline. More specifically, this is the detection of a protective health information, which is carried out by what we call name entity recognition. But now that we have detected everything that is relevant for us, what we need is to obfuscate our mask. We have two strategies. Masking is just removing, removing that information or putting a placeholder instead of those pieces of information. For example, here, instead of Vietnam saying just, for example, location or, or mask or remove, this masking. But what is more, more, interest, uh, more, more interesting is using another strategy that we call obfuscation. Obfuscation is taking these pieces of information that we have detected and changing them so that it doesn't seem like they have been post-processed. So they look like real documents, but the document, but the information about the patient is fake, has been identified. Let me show you. So this is another component that we add to the pipeline, which takes the output of these entities, of name entity recognition, and changes them. We add it to the pipeline, as a the identification component, we run the pipeline. And uh, yeah, just, this is just an analysis of how many different ent protective health information uh, entities we have in, in the documents, names, dates, location, etc. But what I wanted to, to show you, yeah, this is the information we extracted instead of in the visualization widget in a table, but this is the, the most relevant part. In here, this very, last component that we have added, this the identification one takes us, as I was saying before, the detected entities and obfuscates them and, change, uh, and changes them into uh, fake data that is, not, that is not real. Yeah, this table is. Okay, for example, if we take a look at this very uh, same sentence talking about record date, and, and a name, for example, as you can see, we have changed the date to another date. We have changed the name of the patient to another name. So that this is what the identification component does. It just post processes your documents so that they don't contain any protective health information anymore, but they still look like they are original and real uh, patient notes. Yeah. And this is just a, another visualization of a sentence in the document was born in Vietnam, but in the de identified text, it says was born in another place. We uh, did the identification uh, component has already its own vocabulary and you can also add your own words in order to obfuscate to your very own uh, data that you want to use in, in this case. After that, what we have is the textual information that we extracted from OCR, but a little bit different because we have changed it using a de-identification uh, component. So we can store this already in a silver layer in order to post-process it and get any different insights that may be required uh, in our use case. If you want to test it by, by yourself, it's 
uh, the only thing that you need to do, there are two options. Uh, if you are new, new to Databricks, I, I guess you are not because you, you, you have been already working during this webinar. Uh, but anyways, here is the link. To, to create an account. And then also you need to access this uh, johnsnowlabs.com slash Databricks. And we click on it. You will go uh, to this landing pa page, which only requires from you some data as the first name, last name, the company email, the uh, URL of your Databricks instance and a Databricks access token that you can get in Databricks in your settings um, uh, section. With that, we build everything for you. We install your uh, the software, install Jon Snow Labs, Spark NLP, Spark NLP for healthcare, and also OCR, and we then configure the cluster for you. In addition to that, you will have more than 20 Python notebooks with examples that you can uh, execute right away in, in that cluster that will be automatically created for you. And also you will have access to our solution accelerators as well. And there is another way to do that, that is using Partner Connect. Uh, if you go to Partner Connect, you will find us here in Databricks Integration, Databricks Partners List, Jon Snow Labs, and here you just need to follow the instructions about how to connect uh, your account to uh, Jon Snow Labs to use Spark NLP and Spark NLP for healthcare. If you have any doubt, please reach out to us at support at johnsnowlab.com and we will be very happy to help you and to onboard you with our library. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all so much for joining today. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will be sending out a copy of the recording of this as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint presented um, within the next 48 hours. I'd say you should probably have it within 24 hours um, of the webinar. Um, if you do have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself, Haley, or the team. Team. Um, we really appreciate you joining. Um, if you could take a second to answer our poll. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a great rest of the day.